getting into the New Testament. And it's a fitting that we would be doing communion today because if it wasn't for his coming, communion would be meaningless. There would be no reason to have communion, to celebrate his birth. You know, my daughter Christy is ready for her first child to come. She's now almost seven months along and she's ready for it to be over. She's tired of gaining weight. She's tired of feeling bloated. She's tired of not being able to exercise like she'd like. She's tired of her body feeling so different. And she's tired of being tired. She's just ready for it to be over. And she still has two more months to go. You know, nine months can seem like a very long time to have to wait for something. And so is 400 years And that's where we're at, a 400-year period from the last word spoken by the prophet Malachi, and nothing has come about since then. No prophets that were worthy of having uh, something written that they had prophesied about. No leaders that were worthy of of putting a, a, a biography together, so to speak, and included in Scripture. They'd been waiting for what Malachi had said was the day of the Lord coming. And they were waiting, and they were waiting, and they were waiting. After God's people had returned from exile, they had rebuilt the temple, and that's how long they'd had to wait for their Messiah to come, 400 years. But actually, God's people had been waiting for 2,000 years, ever since God had told Abraham, I will make a great nation of you, and all nations will be blessed through you. The prophet Isaiah had foretold what was about to happen 700 years earlier. So waiting was part of the game here. The only problem was they weren't waiting for a baby. They were waiting for a king. That wasn't at all what they were looking for. They weren't looking for a baby to come along. They were looking for a king who would reign on David's throne and overthrow the various kingdoms that had oppressed them over the years. First the Assyrians had come and exiled them, and then the Babylonians had come and and exiled them, and, and then the Persians had come and they'd let some of them go back, and then the Greeks under Alexander the Great had had come and taken over all the known world at that time, and finally... Rome had now come and taken over that and expanded it even further. And they were just fed up and they were tired of waiting. That's where Israel was at. They were tired of waiting. But instead of a king, they got a baby. And a scandalous one at that. But what was a scandal for Joseph and Mary and their families was a solution that God was providing in his upper story. Remember how we've been talking about an upper story. That's God's plan for things. That's God's working throughout all of Scripture from the old through to the new and the lower story where we live, what's going on with us. And in the upper story, what seemed like a scandalous story in the lower story was actually God's plan all along. It was the good news. What appeared to be a scandal was the good news in God's upper story. Joseph wasn't sure what to make of all this that was happening to him in his lower story, so he was considering breaking off the engagement. By the way, if you were looking for a traditional Christmas message here today, eh, it's not like I'm going to ignore it, but it's not going to be your traditional Christmas message. I mean, we just had it a couple months ago, right? We don't need to rehash that, but it is going to be a message that relates to the birth of this king. So Joseph, as I am talking about part of the story here, wasn't sure what was happening in the lower part of lower story of his life, so he was actually considering breaking off the engagement. That is, until an angel visited him. You know what? Reveal parties have become all the rage lately. Everybody, anybody been to a reveal party? You know what that is. That's where they, they finally tell you what the sex of the child is because we can know that now. So they have a big party to reveal it. My daughter had a reveal party, but she'd already revealed it to herself and her, her husband. She was just revealing it to the rest of the family. Now, Cheryl had recently been to a reveal party where the parents didn't know. It was all a big reveal to not only those that were the friends and relatives, but it was revealed to the parents as well what the sex of the child was going to be. And in what amounted to be the first reveal party in history, the angel decided to tell Joseph, you're going to have a baby, and it's going to be a boy. 
and you're to name him Jesus. The first reveal party. He was ki- that Mary was actually carrying ch- God's child, and it was a boy. Everything in the life and history of Israel had been pointing to this one scandalous event. The arrival of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, who they'd been waiting for. Everything that we've been studying in the Old Testament the past several months has been heading up to this very moment in time. Everything's been leading up to this. There's been all kinds of things that have been revealing that Jesus was going to be coming, the Messiah, the Christ. This was the special moment in time. It was such an important moment in time that it split history. No longer was there B.C., before Christ. Now it was A.D. It was after Christ had come. (laughs) I used to think that A.D. stood for after David, but that didn't quite fit, you know. Before Christ, after David, there's quite a a little bit of an overlap there. But uh, Christ was such an important event in history that it split time. As John 1.14 puts it, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. God in flesh, came to be with us. Now think about this for a moment. The phrase, the Word became flesh, implies that there was a time when the Word wasn't in the flesh. The Word, who is God and who is Spirit, was made flesh. The Word, Jehovah God Almighty, came to us and for us. Think about that. He came to us as a baby, and he came for us to die for us, just as we commemorated today. He came to us because we could not go to him. That was an impossibility for us. We can't go to him, but he could come to us. And he came for us because we could not do what needed to be done in our own hearts and lives to get rid of the sin in us. The word, who is fully God, is revealed in Christ Jesus. John 1.1 1, 1 states, in the beginning. Now, isn't that an interesting phrase? In the beginning. Have you heard that phrase somewhere before? Genesis 1.1 1, 1 starts out in the beginning. John 1.1 1, 1 starts in the beginning. It's a return to Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. It's the, showing the continuity between the Old and the New Testament is wrapped up in that one little phrase, in the beginning. Because Jesus didn't just come and get born, and that's the first we ever hear and know about Jesus. No, Jesus has always been. He was there in the beginning of our time, and even before that. From the very beginning of creation, and even before, God was there, and Jesus was there, and the Holy Spirit was there. John 1, 1 through 3 continues, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. And in case you missed the point of who the Word is, he then states in verse 14, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And continues to talk about Jesus so that we know that the word, it, which is capitalized in Scripture, is a title for Jesus. So please listen to that once again as we include the word Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. We need to make sure that we understand that point. That's very important for us to understand who Jesus really is. Jesus is the Word, and He is God, and He's always existed, just as God has always existed, because Jesus is God. Now, the Trinity is one of those holy mysteries. In fact, the word Trinity is not even found in Scripture, but the concept of the Trinity is found throughout Scripture, that there's a God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and there they are all working together. So how does this work? How does the Bible, what does the Bible teach really about Trinity? How does that work? There are three main concepts that we have to grasp and accept. Number one, God is three persons. Hmm, okay. 
Sounds a little strange, but it's true. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they're all God. God is three persons. Number two, we need to know that each is fully God. Jehovah God Almighty is Jesus and Holy Spirit and God. They're all God. Number three, there is one God. Okay, there's God, there's three persons, they're each fully God, there's one God. Three is one. That, you know, for our minds, that doesn't compute. That's the holy mystery of it all. Because it doesn't compute. How can three be one? How can each be fully God and yet there be only one God? That's the essence of this holy mystery. But if we look at Jesus as anything less than God himself, God Almighty, Jehovah God, if we look at him as anything less than that, if we think Jesus is just a good, loving, caring guy, a great prophet, but just a man, then our salvation is based on a lie. We have no salvation. A man could not have died for all of our sins. Just another man could not have done what Jesus did. And if we're trusting in Jesus in a way that's less than that, we're basing our salvation on a lie. He's either God or he was a man, one or the other. And if he's just a man, our belief that we are saved is just a hoax, a great hoax that Jesus, as a man, played on all of us. And we're here based on a hoax then. We've been conned by a great con artist if he's just a man. Only if Jesus is God is our salvation real and meaningful. And he's not just another God who is equal to Jehovah God. Or else scripture is false because Deuteronomy 6.4 states that the Lord our God is one. But yet in, in the beginning of creation in Genesis it says let us create man in our image. So you get the plural And you get the singular all together. So again, how does that work? How can one be three? How does that work? Yeah, it's a holy mystery. If you're looking to me to explain it all to you today, forget it. (laughs) It's just one of those things you got to accept. It's something you take by faith because God's word tells us that's the way it is. And he's not just another God. In fact, as we studied earlier, God is a jealous God who will not accept our worship of any other God. So if Jesus is just another God, he's a jealous God. And he doesn't want us worshiping another God. He wants us to worship him. And Jesus is him. And the Holy Spirit is him. It's all there. Jesus is Jehovah God. He is Almighty God. He is the Creator God. Jesus didn't just come into existence when he was born in Bethlehem. He has always existed, just as God has always existed, because he is God. Now, I know that's a hard concept. I understand that, because it boggles my mind sometimes, too, and it is hard. And it makes it really hard because we have nothing else really to compare it to or relate it to. That doesn't make sense to us. It mathematically doesn't work. It logically doesn't work. We can't really grasp that in full concept because it's hard. There's nothing that we can relate it to. But you know what? Just because we cannot fully grasp the concept of the Trinity does not make it untrue. Just because we can't figure it out, we can't in our own mind make that all compute, that doesn't make it untrue. Isaiah 55, 8 tells us, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. If we can't accept that he is so far above us that there can be something about him that we can't quite grasp, then who do we think we are? To think that we have to be able to understand it all completely before we can believe it. We can't. We won't. And we've got to just remember that and accept that. God's thoughts and ways are so far above ours that just because we can't understand them does not make them untrue. But God's word tells us it's true. This Jesus was made flesh with teeth and toenails and two kidneys. He was not part man and part God. 
He was fully man and fully God. Again, a little bit of a hard concept. A little bit hard to understand that he was fully man and fully God. But this Christ is not just another world leader like Cyrus or Alexander or Caesar. He was not going to be just another great man of God like Abraham or Moses or David. God was going to reveal himself in the most personal, personal way possible as a human being living amongst us and teaching us his ways. And if you can't see that there is a lot of that going on, where he's actually teaching us God's ways, not man's ways, all you got to do is continue to read the New Testament. We're going to get there. We're going to get into all of that. How his concepts and his thoughts about what really God wanted to teach us is many times far different than what the rabbis were teaching, what the religious leaders were teaching, what their traditions were teaching. Quite a bit different. So Jesus was born in the ordinary way to ordinary people. That was the way Jesus came about. His earthly father, Joe, was just an ordinary carpenter. Just an ordinary guy who worked as a carpenter. But there was an important fact about Joseph's heritage that made him very special, very unique, and very much the one who needed to be his adopted father here on earth. He was from the line of David, which was quite important because the Messiah was prophesied to be from the line of David. Now you go, hey, pastor, wait a minute. Wasn't God his father? Yes. Joseph didn't have anything to do with that birth, right? Right. But you just said he was his father. He's his earthly father. He's his adopted father because under Jewish law, when you accepted a child into your family, you became his father. So Joseph was his father, even though he wasn't involved in the actual birth. The DNA will not show Joseph's DNA in there, but he is Jesus' father. And he is of the line of David. And so it fulfills that prophecy. In fact, let's take a quick look at this genealogy. It's found in Matthew chapter 1. I really want to encourage you, if you've got your Bible, to turn there. Matthew chapter 1, the first 16 verses. We're going to discover some very interesting people in his genealogy that we've been studying about in the story. And I think these names might ring a bell now all of a sudden as we start reading through this. Matthew begins, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now he skips a few generations there, but he's just wanting to let you know these are the important people that is in Jesus' line. David, who he needed to be in that line of, but it takes it all the way back to Father Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, who didn't die. As a sacrifice, remember? We didn't get that. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and all of his brothers. The 12 tribes of Israel, of course, came from Jacob's family. Judah was one of them. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz. Oh, here's getting to a name we kind of recognize, whose mother was Rahab. Uh huh. This is the Rahab that was the prostitute that kept, kept the Israelite spies that came into Jericho. She housed them for a while and helped them to escape from Jericho. And in exchange for safety for her and her family, when the Israelites came to destroy Jericho. And she was then included into the family of the Israelites. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. This is, of course, the Ruth of the book of the Bible. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. Yes, that King David, the one that the ancestry had to fall under for him to be truly 
want the Messiah, the one prophesied to be the Messiah. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. This, of course, is a reference to Bathsheba and uh, not one of the greatest moments in King David's life that's recorded in Scripture. Again, a wonderful way that the Bible puts everything out there. The good, the bad, the ugly, everything is in there, including David's sin with Bathsheba and his murder of her wife, of his of her husband, Uriah. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, who's the dummy, that's the only way I can think of it. He's a dummy who uh, caused the kingdom to be divided into the southern kingdom and the southern uh, northern kingdom. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa, Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham. By the way, Uzziah, remember that name? Isaiah talks about in the, in the year that King Uzziah uh, died. You know, he's talking about that time frame. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Hazel, he, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, you may recall, if you did your reading, was one of the worst kings Judah ever had. Terrible. So even in his genealogy, there's some good people, there's some bad people. And they're all listed there. It doesn't sugarcoat it. Manasseh, the father of Ammon. Ammon, the father of Josiah. Josiah, the father of Jeconiah. And his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Oh, you recognize that name? Zerubbabel, the one who led the first exiles back. It led about 50,000 of the exiles back and got them to start building the, the altar and start building the temple. Zerubbabel, the father of Abiad. Abiad, the father of Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Akim. Akim, the father of Eliud. Eliud, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Mathan. Mathan, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. So sometimes you, you look through that list and you go, oh, all these names, I can't even pronounce them anyway, and don't, don't think that my pronunciation is correct because I just made them up as I went along. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but think about his ancestors. First of all, the father of Israel itself, Abraham. Two foreign women, Ruth and Rahab, a Canaanite and a Moabite foreign women that's in his history, with one being a prostitute, one of the best and one of the worst kings Judah ever had, and one of the heroes of the returning exiles. It's a real mixed bag of good and bad people, heroes and villains. Have any of you ever done your genealogies? I bet if you go back, you're going to find the same thing. You're going to find some good people, some bad people, some heroes, some villains, except for mine. Mine are all just great people all the way back. And just, yeah, right, right, right. But that four women, and some of them Gentiles are included, links Jesus was all humanity. Do you see that? It's in his genealogy even to have an open heart to all of humanity. The Messiah was born to all and for all. All of us. It wasn't just for the Jews that he came to provide salvation. It was for all of us. And he was born at just the right time. The perfect time, as of course he would be because it was in God's time. So it was perfect. Think about all the elements of world history that had come together at just that place in time. Alexander had conquered the known world at that time and established the Greek language amongst all of those peoples. It was the language of commerce. It was the common language that everybody could communicate in. Think about how important that is for the spread of the gospel. Next, Rome had conquered them and established the Pax Romana, as it was called, or the Roman peace. And the world experienced an unprecedented time of world peace for many, many years under Roman rule. 
Now, it's true that this peace was brought about by some very harsh means and treatment towards anybody that was a dissident against the Roman government, but the world was at peace for centuries. Roads were built, commerce flourished, and they didn't change the language. They kept the Greek language. They didn't insist on Latin being the language. So here you've got a common language. You've got peace, although harsh treatment to make that peace has established, but peace, roads being built, commerce flourishing. Think about what that meant to the early church and how the message of Jesus Christ was spread just the right time, just the right circumstances, just the right thing, just as God had planned it all along. They'd wanted, they didn't want to wait that long, but it was exactly in God's timing. That's when the Messiah was born and the church was allowed to spread rapidly and easily. But the word Jesus was turned away by many people. The religious leaders turned away from Jesus. Many people turned him away. Even the innkeeper had to decide whether he'd turn him away or not. And you know what? We have the same decision to make. Are we going to turn Jesus away or not? Are we going to accept who Jesus really is or not? Are we just going to say, no, I understand that he's a religious, I mean, he's a religious figure and a historical figure, but God? Nah, can't be. We're going to accept Jesus for who God's word says he is or not? Are we going to accept him into our heart and life or not? Some send them away because they think it's too late. They think they've already done too much and can never be forgiven. But it's never too late. You only need to open the door of your heart to Jesus. He doesn't come in with a list of things for you to do. He comes really with a list of things that he's already done. And we celebrated that this morning. He's already done it. He's already paid the price. He's already paid for our sin. He's already provided the way of salvation. He's become the perfect sacrificial lamb, one that lasts for all time, for all people, not just the Jews, but for all people. He's already paid the price. So will we find a place for Jesus in our lives, or will we send him away? All we have to simply do is pray, Jesus Please come in and make my heart your home. And he promises that he will do just that. Nothing you've ever done will be too bad for him to forgive. I mean, we talked about David. He committed adultery. He committed murder. Yet he was considered one of the greatest kings that they'd ever had. In fact, God considered him a man after my own heart because he was willing to forgive him because David was willing to repent and say, I'm sorry. I really messed up. I need your forgiveness. And Jesus and God gave it to him. And that's the way it is for anyone here today. Jesus will forgive you. Jesus will cleanse you from the inside out. And he'll come into your heart and life to stay if you'll simply open the door to him and ask him in. Shall we pray? Our dearly Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for thinking about us and saying, these people have really royally messed it up. This is not what I originally designed for them. But yet I knew they were going to mess it up. And I'd already planned for that. I'd already planned to send my son to be born as a little baby, to grow up to teach people my ways and to then die for their sins so that they, if they would just simply believe in him, they would have eternal life and forgiveness of their sins. Lord, if there's anyone here who needs to come to that place in their own heart and life, Lord, speak to them. Help them to understand it's that simple. 
They just have to open the door of their heart to you and ask you to come in to clean them up from the inside out. And you'll do just that. You'll forgive them and save them and play, make a place in eternity in heaven with you for that person. All they have to simply do is say, Jesus, come into my heart today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.